In this video, we're going to go over how to draw Lewis structures of simple molecules, organic compounds, polyatomic ions, and a lot of other stuff as well. We're going to talk about how to determine the molecular geometry, also how to calculate the formal charge, determine if there's any resonance structures, and also determine if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. So we're going to cover all of that in this video. So let's talk about the basics. On the periodic table, on the second row, you'll see elements like boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Boron is found in group 3A of the periodic table, so it has three valence electrons. Carbon is found in group 4A, so it has four valence electrons. Nitrogen has five, oxygen has six, fluorine has seven. Now the same is true for any elements below uh, these elements. For example, chlorine and bromine also have seven valence electrons. Beryllium has two valence electrons and lithium has one. Now using this information you can determine or you can get a good estimation of how many bonds these elements like to form. Now it's important to understand that elements on the upper right corner of the periodic table, mostly the nonmetals, they like to acquire electrons. They like to have eight electrons in their in their outer shell, so to speak. So fluorine wants to have eight electrons. It's electronegative. It needs one more electron to get to eight. So fluorine is going to form one bond to get that one extra electron. It needs to satisfy its octet requirements. Oxygen has six valence electrons. It's a nonmetal. It likes to acquire electrons. It needs two more to get to eight. So oxygen likes to form two bonds to get the eight electrons that it needs. Nitrogen likes to form three bonds. Carbon likes to form four. Now the elements on the, the left side, typically the metals, they like to give away electrons. It's easier for boron to give away three electrons instead of a trying to acquire five electrons. So boron likes to form three bonds. Beryllium has two valence electrons and it likes to give away those two electrons. So it's gonna form two bonds. Lithium, if you, ha if you see lithium in a structure, it's probably gonna form one ionic bond. So it's gonna be just one for lithium. So as you can see, carbon forms the most number of bonds for the most part, at least in the, the second row for all of the elements in the second row. Now, once you go to the third row, you can have what is known as an expanded octet. Elements such as phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, they can have more than four bonds. They can have more than eight electrons. And here's why. In the first row, all you have is the 1s sublevel and S can only hold two electrons. Now in the second row, or in the second energy level, you have two sublevels, 2S and 2P. Hopefully at this point you've studied electron configuration, so you should be familiar with these numbers and symbols. Now P can hold six electrons, two plus six is eight. So second row elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, they cannot have more than eight electrons. So carbon will never form more than four bonds. Same is true for nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Oxygen, for instance, likes to form two bonds. In water, if you draw the Lewis structure for water, oxygen has two bonds, and oxygen is neutral in that particular molecule. If you draw the structure hydroxide, it has one bond and it has a negative charge. If you draw H3O plus, the hydronium ion, oxygen bears a, a positive formal charge. So anytime an element deviates from its ideal bond number, it typically contains a formal charge. Nitrogen is neutral in NH3. It has three bonds. But if you draw the NH4 plus ammonium ion, it's going to have four bonds and it's going to deviate from the ideal number of three. Now in the third row, you have three sublevels, 3s, 3p, and 3d. 
If you add up 2, 6, and 10, you will get 18. So elements in the third row, like phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, they can have more than four bonds. Four bonds equates to eight electrons. So they can have what is known as an expanded octet. Now, these elements, they have access to the 3D orbital, or the 3D sublevel. And so that's why they can have an expanded octet. They can have more than eight electrons, or more than four bonds. Now, in the course of this video, you'll see that chlorine, sometimes it's going to form one bond, sometimes it's going to form seven bonds, or up to seven, I should say. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. It can acquire one electron to get to eight, in which case it's going to form one bond to do that, or it can give away all of its seven valence electrons and form up to seven bonds. Sulfur has six valence electrons. So sulfur can either acquire two to get to eight, in which case it'll form two bonds, or it can give away all six of its valence electrons to form six bonds. If you draw the Lewis structure for H2S, sulfur has two bonds. But if you draw the sulfate structure, in this case, it's going to have six bonds. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. It can acquire three electrons to get to eight, in which case it's going to form three bonds, or it can give away its five valence electrons and form five bonds. So in pH3, phosphorus is neutral and it has three bonds. It doesn't have a charge. And in PO4, 3 minus, the most stable resonance structure for the phosphate ion, you'll see that phosphorus will have five bonds. So I want to just give you some general trends in terms of the number of bonds that certain elements like to form. So keep this information in mind as we continue to draw Lewis structures. So let's start with simple structures. How can we draw the Lewis structure for fluorine? Fluorine is a diatomic molecule, but what can we do to draw the Lewis structure? Now the first thing you can do is add up the number of valence electrons. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, and there's two of them, so the structure that we need to draw should contain a total of 14 valence electrons. Now, as we mentioned before, fluorine, which is a halogen, likes to form one bond. So knowing that, it's safe to start with a single bond between the two fluorine atoms. This single bond is a, a nonpolar covalent bond. In the covalent bond, electrons are shared between the two elements. In a nonpolar covalent bond, they're shared equally. Because the two fluorine elements are the same, the distribution of electrons will be the same. So this is a nonpolar molecule, and the bond is also nonpolar. Now, typically, whenever an element has one bond attached to it, it usually contains three lone pairs. Not always, but usually. When an element has two bonds attached to it, it usually contains two lone pairs. And when it has three bonds attached to it, it usually contains one lone pair, so that it can have a total of eight electrons around it to satisfy its octet requirement. And that's just the general trend. Now, that general trend typically is true for elements that are on the outside of the molecule not the center element. Sometimes it's true for the center element, except when it has an expanded octet. But for the outer elements attached to the center element, that trend usually is or holds true. Now, fluorine has one bond, so it's going to have three lone pairs. So that each fluorine atom have eight electrons around itself. So this is two, four, six, eight electrons. Every bond equates to two electrons. So each fluorine atom has eight electrons around it, but two electrons are shared, so the total is 14. This is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So if you can draw a structure where every atom that's in the second row have eight electrons, typically the elements in the second row starting from carbon and to the right of carbon. And if the number of electrons add up to this number,
it's safe to say that you have the correct structure. By the way, elements to the left of carbon, like boron, beryllium, and lithium, they will have what is known as an incomplete octet. They will have less than eight electrons. So this is the Lewis structure for F2. Now let's draw the Lewis structure for O2, oxygen gas, which is also a diatomic molecule. So let's begin by adding the number of valence electrons. So oxygen is a calcogen in group 6A, and it has six valence electrons, so it has a total of 12. And as you mentioned before, because oxygen has six valence electrons, it needs two more to get to eight, oxygen likes to form two bonds. So with that information, it's good if we start with a double bond. Now, when an element has two bonds, typically it has two lone pairs, so that it can have eight electrons around it. So let's begin by putting two lone pairs on each oxygen atom. So if you notice, each oxygen atom has eight electrons around it. Two, four, six, eight. A double bond represents four electrons. And the total number of electrons is 12. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So this is the Lewis structure for the oxygen molecule. That's how you draw it. Now what about nitrogen gas, N2, which is also diatomic? What would you do to draw the Lewis structure for this molecule? By the way, for each of these examples, it would be wise if you pause the video and work out these examples yourself to see if you're able to get the right answer. The best way to learn is by practice. And as you work out these examples, you're going to get a better understanding of how to draw Lewis structures. So nitrogen has five valence electrons, and there's two of them, so the nitrogen molecule has a total of 10 uh, valence electrons. Now, because nitrogen has five electrons and it wants to have eight, nitrogen likes to form three bonds. So let's begin by putting a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms. And any time an element has three bonds, generally speaking, it's going to have one lone pair. So let's put one lone pair on each nitrogen atom. So the nitrogen on the left has two, four, six, eight electrons. So its octet requirement is satisfied. And this entire molecule has a total of two, four, six, eight, ten electrons, which is also correct. So this is the Lewis structure for the nitrogen molecule. This molecule has a linear geometry. As you can see, it's straight. The bond angle of a straight line is 180 degrees. For a full circle, it's 360. Now, this molecule, would you say it's polar or nonpolar? Anytime you have a substance that consists of only one element, that substance is nonpolar. The electrons are shared equally in a substance like that. For a substance to be polar, one side has to have a positive charge or a partial positive charge, and the other side needs to be negatively charged. This is a polarized object. But since the elements are the same, the electrons are shared equally, and so it's a nonpolar molecule. So N2, O2, F2, even H2, all of these are nonpolar molecules. Now, what is the bond order for the nitrogen molecule? It turns out that the bond order is basically equal to the number of bonds you see. So for N2, the bond order is 3, since it has a triple bond. For O2, the bond order is going to be 2, since it has a double bond between the two oxygen molecules. Now what about for F2? For F2, it contained a single bond, so the bond order is 1. Now what about this uh, molecule, H2, hydrogen gas? How can we draw the Lewis structure for it? Now hydrogen only has one valence electron. It's in the first row, we have two of them. So this molecule has a total of two electrons. Elements in the first row, like hydrogen or helium,
they can only have up to two electrons in their energy level. So hydrogen doesn't require an octet of eight electrons. So therefore, hydrogen will always form one single bond. Because that single bond contains all the electrons that it needs, which is two electrons. You should never add any lone pairs to a hydrogen atom. This is it. And that's the Lewis structure for H2. Now our next example is BH3. Borane. How can we draw the Lewis structure for this molecule? Now, as we mentioned before, we said that boron is going to have an incomplete octet, and boron likes to form three bonds. Boron has three valence electrons. Hydrogen has one, but there's three of them, so the total is six uh, valence electrons. Now, we know that hydrogen will only form one bond, so we can start with a single bond. This is two, four, six electrons. We already have the number of electrons that we need, which is six. So we don't need to add any more electrons. This is it. That's the Lewis structure for BH3. It has six electrons, which is less than eight. So boron has an incomplete octet, but it has its desired number of bonds, as you can see, which is three bonds. So this is the Lewis structure for BH3. That's how you draw it. Now, what is the molecular geometry for this molecule? Whenever you have a molecule where the center atom is attached to three atoms, and if the center atom has no lone pairs, this molecule has a trigonal planar shape. Now, there's two things you need to be familiar with, electron pair geometry and molecular geometry. These two are going to be the same if the center atom has no lone pair. If the center atom has a lone pair, then the electron pair geometry and the molecular geometry will uh, differ. Now, what I recommend you doing, or that you should do at this point, is go to Google Images and type in molecular geometry worksheet or something like that. So you could be familiar with the different shapes and the names of those shapes. So make sure you uh, go ahead and do that when you get a chance. Now, this particular molecule, would you say it's polar or nonpolar? Anytime you have a molecule where the center atom doesn't have any lone pairs, and if all of the outer elements are the same, basically, if this molecule is symmetrical, it's going to be nonpolar. All of the dipole moments will cancel. I'll go into more detail throughout this video, but for now, anytime all of the outer elements are the same, it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. The bond angle that corresponds to a trigonal planar shape is 120 degrees. Now, what can help you remember that bond angle is if you think of a circle, a full circle is 360 degrees. So if you split a circle into three parts, 360 divided by 3 is 120. So the bond angle between two hydrogen atoms is going to be 120. That can help you to remember the bond angle for any trigonal planar shape. Now let's consider the Lewis structure for these three uh, substances. Water, the hydronium ion H3O+, and the hydroxide ion, OH-. Now, earlier in this video, we said that oxygen likes to form two bonds. It has six valence electrons. It needs two more to get to eight, so it likes to form two bonds. That's the ideal number of bonds. However, oxygen can form three bonds or one bond. But in a situation like that, it's going to have a formal charge. But whenever it has its desired number of bonds, it's going to be stable, which means the formal charge is zero. The equation to calculate the formal charge of an atom, at least this is the equation I use, it's the number of valence electrons minus the bonds and dots on that element. So let's take water for example. In water, H2O, hydrogen has one valence electron, and there's two of them, and oxygen has six. So it has a total of eight. So let's start with oxygen. 
So we know hydrogen can only form a single bond. So that means hydrogen, I mean oxygen, has two bonds. Each bond represents two electrons. So we have four plus the two non the, the two lone pairs or also called non-bonding electrons. So we can see oxygen has a total of eight. Two, four, six, eight. Which agrees with that number. Now if we calculate the formal charge on oxygen, it's going to be the six valence electrons that oxygen has. In this structure it has two bonds, four dots, two and four. So two plus four is six, six minus six is zero. So as we can see, whenever oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs, it has a formal charge of zero. Which means oxygen is very stable in this configuration. Now, what is the molecular geometry of this molecule? Whenever you have a molecule that has two atoms connected to the center atom and two lone pairs on a center atom, if you look at that worksheet on Google Images, this is going to have a bent molecular geometry or molecular shape. The electron pair geometry is going to be tetrahedral. Anytime an element has four groups total, if you count atoms and lone pairs as groups, not including the center atom, so one, two, three, four, anytime an atom has four groups, it's going to, the electron pair geometry is going to be tetrahedral. If it has two groups, it's going to be linear, three, trigonal planar, four, tetrahedral, five, trigonal bipyramidal, six, octahedral. That's for the electron pair geometry. So we have two lone pairs, two atoms attached to the central atom. So we have a total of four groups. The electron pair geometry is a tetrahedral for this structure. Now the bond angle for water you should basically memorize this number. It's going to be 104.5. Simply commit that to memory. Now let's move on to uh, H3O+. So how many valence electrons is found in the hydronium ion, H3O+. So oxygen has 6, hydrogen has 1 times 3, and whenever you see a plus charge, you need to subtract one from the total number of valence electrons. So 6 plus 3 is 9, minus 1 is 8. So let's start with oxygen. So oxygen is attached to three hydrogen atoms. Those three bonds represent six electrons. We need to get to 8, so that means oxygen has one lone pair. So that's the Lewis structure for the hydronium ion. Now we know the net charge is plus one. Let's calculate the formal charge of the central oxygen atom. So oxygen has six valence electrons. It has three bonds and one lone pair, which is equal to two dots. Three plus two is five, six minus five is one. So therefore oxygen has a plus one formal charge. And that's why the total charge is plus one. It's because of the oxygen atom. As we can see, because oxygen does not have its ideal number of two bonds, it's going to have a formal charge. Now, what is the molecular geometry and the electron pair geometry of H3O plus? How can we figure that part? So oxygen has three atoms attached to it and it has one lone pair. For a situation like that, the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. So that is the molecular geometry for H3O+. Now the electron pair geometry, because it has three atoms, one lone pair, it has a total of four groups. Anytime an element has four groups, the electron pair geometry is going to be tetrahedral. The same is true for water. 
the total number of groups is 4. The electron pair geometry will always be tetrahedral whenever you have a total uh, number of 4 groups. So that's it for H3O+. Let's move on to hydroxide. In hydroxide, oxygen has 6 valence electrons, hydrogen has 1, but because we have a negative charge, we need to add 1 to the total number of valence electrons, which once again we have 8. Now because it's only one hydrogen atom, this is going to be one bond. Hydrogen will always form just a single bond. So right now, we have only two electrons in that single bond. So we need to add three lone pairs. Two, four, six, eight. And as we mentioned before, any time an atom has one bond, generally speaking, it's going to have three lone pairs. In the case of HGO+, whenever an atom has three bonds, it usually has one lone pair. And in the case of water, whenever an atom has two bonds, it usually has two lone pairs. Knowing these general trends will help you to quickly draw a molecule. So we know that the total charge is going to be negative one for the hydroxide ion. And we can see that oxygen does not have its ideal number of bonds, which is two. So that's a good indication it's going to have a charge, probably negative one. But let's use the equation to calculate it. The formal charge equation is the number of valence electrons minus the bonds and the dots. So oxygen has six valence electrons. In this structure, it only has one bond, but it has three lone pairs, which is six dots, two, four, six. Now, one plus six is seven, and six minus seven is equal to negative one. Therefore, oxygen has a negative one formal charge. So as we can see, whenever an element deviates from its ideal number of bonds, it typically has a formal charge. Now consider the next two molecules, CO2, also known as carbon dioxide, and CO, carbon monoxide. Now what I want you to do is I want you to draw the Lewis structures for these two molecules and explain why carbon monoxide, CO, is polar but CO2 is nonpolar when they both have polar bonds. So let's analyze the CO bond. Carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5 and oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5. Whenever the electronegativity difference between two elements, if it's 0.5 or more, the bond is considered to be a polar bond or a polar covalent bond. The reason why it's still called a covalent bond is because the electrons between carbon and oxygen are being shared between those two elements. But it's a polar covalent bond because they're being shared unequally. Because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, it's going to pull the electrons toward itself. And so oxygen is going to acquire a partial negative charge, and carbon is going to be partially positive. So whenever you have an unequal distribution of electrons, one side of the molecule is going to be positive, and the other side is going to be negative. And when you have this separation of charge, you have a polarized substance. Therefore, we could say that the carbon-oxygen bond is polar. One side is positive, the other side is negative. So if both molecules contain polar bonds, how is it that CO2 is nonpolar, but CO is polar? So let's begin by drawing the Lewis structure of CO2, and then we'll draw the Lewis structure for CO. Now, in CO2, carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has six times two. Six times two is 12, plus four is 16. Now, there is a certain technique that will help you to draw the Lewis structures with ease. And it's basically called the multiple of eight rule. Whenever a molecule 
has a multiple of 8 electrons, 8, 16, 24, 32, and if, if there's no hydrogen atoms attached to it, then it's going to have no lone pairs on the center atom. So in CO2, we have 16 valence electrons. 16 is a multiple of 8. So on the central carbon atom, there should be no lone pairs. And I want to emphasize that this is only true if, and only if, there's no hydrogen atoms attached to this molecule. If there is, then this multiple of 8 technique will not work. Now, we know that carbon likes to form 4 bonds, and oxygen likes to form 2 bonds. Knowing that fact will help us to draw this Lewis structure with ease. So since oxygen likes to have 2 bonds, let's start with a double bond. In this situation, carbon has 4 bonds, each oxygen atom has 2. So everything is good right now. And as you mentioned before, whenever an outer element has two bonds, typically it has two lone pairs. So let's put two lone pairs on each oxygen atom. So every element has its desired number of bonds, and also the octet requirement of each element is satisfied. Oxygen has eight electrons around it, two, four, six, eight. And carbon also has eight electrons around it. 2, 4, 6, 8. Each bond is 2 electrons, so whenever carbon has 4 bonds, it's basically happy. So this is the Lewis structure of carbon dioxide. As you can see, it's a linear molecule, so it has a bond angle of 180 degrees. The hybridization at the center carbon atom is sp, or sp hybridized. Now, what about CO? Let's draw the Lewis structure for that. So carbon has 4, and oxygen has 6. So the total is 10, which is not a multiple of 8. But then, in this particular molecule, we don't know what the center atom is. Either case, there's going to be a lone pair on each element. Now, carbon likes to form 4 bonds, but oxygen likes to form 2. If we put two bonds, carbon is not going to be happy, it wants four. If we put four bonds, oxygen is not going to be happy because it wants two. So what can we do in this situation? Carbon wants four, oxygen wants two. So these two, when they get together, they need to form some sort of agreement. So they're going to settle on three. It turns out that in this molecule, it's going to have three bonds, which is not the ideal number for oxygen and it's not the ideal number for carbon. It's simply an average of 4 and 2, which is 3. So since each element does not have their ideal number of bonds, both elements will have a formal charge. Now right now we have 6 electrons, and as we mentioned before, whenever an element has 3 bonds, typically it has 1 lone pair. So since each element has three bonds. Let's put a lone pair on each. Now we have a total of 10 electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And each element has eight electrons around it, which satisfies its octet requirement. 2, 4, 6, 8. So carbon and oxygen has eight electrons around it due to the uh, six electrons that are being shared in the middle. Now, let's calculate the formal charge on the carbon atom and on the oxygen atom in CO. So let's start with carbon. So carbon has four valence electrons, and in that structure, it has a triple bond, which is three bonds, and it has a lone pair, which equates to two dots. So three plus two is five, and four minus five is negative one. Now what about oxygen? Oxygen has six valence electrons, and this structure has three bonds, two dots. So six minus five is plus one. So the carbon has a negative formal charge, and oxygen has a positive formal charge. When you add the charges, the total charge is zero. That's why overall, 
carbon monoxide is a neutral molecule, but the elements within it contain formal charges. Now, why is it that CO is polar and CO2 is nonpolar? We need to look at something called dipole moments. To draw the dipole moment, it's basically an arrow that points towards the, the negatively charged element. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it's going to bear the partial negative charge. And carbon is partially positive. So if we draw the dipole moment towards the partial negative oxygen atom, notice that it cancels for CO2 due to the symmetry of this molecule. But for CO, it doesn't cancel. So for CO2, the net dipole moment is zero. That's why it's a nonpolar molecule. But for CO, it's polar because it has a net dipole moment. Now let's move on to hybridization. Now let's say if you have an atom that's attached to two other atoms, and let's say it has two lone pairs. How can you calculate or determine the hybridization of the central atom? If the number of groups on that atom, let's say it's two, where the number of groups is the number of atoms attached to it and lone pairs, the hybridization is going to be S1P1. If the total number of groups is three, it's going to be S1P2. It's SP3 for four, S1P3D1 for five. Notice that the exponents add up to the number of groups. And for six groups, it's going to be S1P3D2. So in this particular example, the hybridization at the central atom is going to be, let's see, one, two, three, four. So we have four groups. It's going to be SP3 hybridized. So knowing that, what is the hybridization of boron in BH3? So boron is attached to three atoms. So it has a total of three groups. Therefore, the hybridization is going to be S1P2, or simply SP2 hybridized. Now, what about for water? What's the hybridization of the central oxygen atom? So in water, oxygen is attached to two atoms, and it has two lone pairs. So it has four groups. It's SP3 hybridized. Now try this one. Draw the Lewis structure for methane. Determine the molecular geometry and if it's polar or nonpolar. And also determine the hybridization. Carbon has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one times four. The total is eight. Now we know that hydrogen can only form one bond. And carbon likes to form four bonds. So this is the Lewis structure for CH4. This molecule has a tetrahedral molecular geometry. And since there's no lone pairs on the central carbon atom, the electron pair geometry is the same as the molecular geometry, tetrahedral. The bond angle at the central carbon atom is 109.5. As for the hybridization, it has four groups, so the carbon atom is sp3 hybridized. Now, is it polar or is it nonpolar? Anytime you have a molecule that is composed of only carbon and hydrogen atoms, it will always be nonpolar. And there's two reasons why. First, the carbon hydrogen bond is nonpolar. Carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5, and for hydrogen, it's 2.1. So the EN difference, or the electronegativity difference, it's less than 0.5, which means it's a nonpolar bond. Nevertheless, there is a small electronegativity difference, so you still do have a small dipole moment. 
Now carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So carbon bears the partial negative charge and hydrogen bears the partial positive charge. So if you were to draw the dipole moment, it's going to point towards the carbon atom. So even though these dipole moments are small, they still exist. Nevertheless, notice that they all cancel due to the symmetry of this molecule. These two are in opposite directions, and the same is true for those two. So the net dipole moment for this molecule is zero. Therefore, CH4 is a nonpolar molecule. Now, what about NH3? How can we draw the Lewis structure for this molecule? Nitrogen has five valence electrons plus the three from the three hydrogen atoms, so the total is eight. And we know that nitrogen likes to form one, I mean, three bonds. Hydrogen can only form one bond. So three bonds equates to six electrons, so nitrogen's going to have a lone pair. That's the Lewis structure for NH3. It has a trigonal, pyramidal, molecular geometry, and the bond angle is about 107 degrees. Now, for the electron pair geometry, the total number of groups is four. Nitrogen has three atoms and one lone pair. So it has a total of four groups. So it has a, a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Now, since it has four groups, what is the hybridization at the central nitrogen atom? For four groups, the hybridization is going to be S1P3, which adds up to four. Now, what is the hybridization of the hydrogen atom? Hydrogen only has one atom attached to it, so the hybridization for hydrogen is simply S. Now, the NH3 molecule, is it polar or is it nonpolar? What would you say? Well, let's analyze the NH bond. Let's make some space first. Nitrogen has an electronegativity value of 3.0, and for hydrogen, it's 2.1. So the electronegativity difference is 0.9, which is much greater than 0.5. So the bond is indeed polar. Nitrogen bears the partial negative charge, since it's more electronegative than hydrogen. So if we draw all of the dipole moments, they're going to point towards the center nitrogen atom. And as you can see, the arrows are pointing in the upward direction. And due to the presence of this lone pair, the dipole moments do not cancel. So there's a net dipole moment, which means that NH3 is a polar molecule. Now let's consider two molecules, CO2 and SO2, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Carbon dioxide is nonpolar but sulfur dioxide is polar. The question is why? Why is SO2 a polar molecule where they both contain two oxygen atoms? CO2 and SO2, they appear to be similar, but why is it that SO2 is polar and CO2 is not? We know that the Lewis structure for CO2 looks like this. It has a linear molecular geometry, and the carbon atom is sp hybridized. Since the carbon has two groups attached to it, S1P2, I mean S1P1 adds up to two. And the dipole moments cancel. So that's why CO2 is nonpolar. But let's go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for SO2. Sulfur has six valence electrons, and the same is true for oxygen. It has six as well. Both elements are in the same group, that is group 6A, and so they all have six electrons. Sulfur and oxygen are known as calcogens.
So if you add the electrons, it's 18. Now, 18 is not a multiple of 8, which means that there's going to be a lone pair on a central sulfur atom. To find out the number of lone pairs, subtract 18 by the highest multiple of 8, just under 18. So the highest multiple of 8 is going to be 8, 16, 24 is too much, so let's subtract 18 by 16. This will give us 2. This tells us that there's going to be two dots, which equates to one lone pair, on a central sulfur atom. Now we have two oxygen atoms. Now how should we draw the Lewis structure? Should it be like this, with a single bond, or should we use double bonds? And how can you tell? Well, let's get into that later. But let's say that this is the Lewis structure for sulfur dioxide. Is it polar or nonpolar? Due to the presence of the lone pair, the molecule has a bent shape. And we know that oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. The electronegativity for oxygen is 3.5, for sulfur it's 2.5. So the EN difference is about 1, which means that the SO bond is polar. If you draw the dipole moments, it's going to point towards the oxygen atom. So notice that these two arrows, they do not cancel. That's why SO2 is a polar molecule. They partially cancel, but there's a net dipole moment that goes this way. Now, for those of you who have taken physics, if you want to see why these dipole moments partially cancel, but not completely, see it this way. So we have a dipole moment going towards uh, the left, but down at the same time. And we have another one going this way. So the first one and the second one has a y component that is directed in the negative y axis. And they both have an x component. One is towards the right, the other is towards the left. So the x components of the dipole moments, they cancel. However, the y components, they're parallel to each other. They're going down in the same direction, so they add up and form a larger dipole moment in the negative y direction. So that's why we could say this is a polar molecule. Now keep in mind, a polarized object is simply an object where you have separation of charge. If you were to draw the SO2 molecule, it would look something like this. It has three atoms. The sulfur has a partial positive charge. And oxygen, being more electronegative, bears the partial negative charge. So whenever you have a, a separation of charge or an uneven distribution of electrons, you have a polarized substance. As you can see, the top part of the molecule has a positive charge. And the bottom part, where the two oxygens are located, has a negative charge. And this is a typical feature of a polar molecule. One side is positive and the other side is negative. Now, I mentioned that there are other Lewis structures for SO2. And I'm going to talk about it when I go over resonance. So stay tuned for that. Now, earlier in this video, I said that sulfur has six valence electrons. And sulfur can either acquire two more electrons to get to eight, or it can give away its six valence electrons. So sulfur can form two bonds. Sometimes it can form six bonds and still have a formal charge of zero. Consider the Lewis structure for H2S. Hydrogen has two electrons total, since there's two of them, plus six. So the total number of electrons is eight. So H2S has the same molecular geometry as H2O. It has a, a bent molecular geometry. And the electron pair geometry is tetrahedral, since it has two atoms, two lone pairs, which is four groups. The sulfur-hydrogen bond is relatively nonpolar. The electronegativity difference is only 0.4. But nevertheless, 
it does have a bent shape, and H2S does dissolve in water, so we should expect that this molecule is slightly polar due to the, the bent shape. But as you can see, in this structure, sulfur only has two bonds. Sulfur bears the partial negative charge, and hydrogen is partially positive. In this case, sulfur is acquiring the two electrons it needs, since it bears the partial negative charge. And that's why it has two bonds. Whenever an element acquires an electron, it gains a negative charge. Whenever an element, like a metal, gives away an electron, it acquires a positive charge. So whenever sulfur is acquiring electrons, it only needs to form two bonds to get to eight electrons since it has six. And that's what we see here. Now sulfur can also give away all of its six electrons. And it can form six bonds. Now this can happen when sulfur is bonded to an element that's more electronegative than itself. So in this molecule, SF6, sulfur is going to have six bonds. Sulfur has six valence electrons, fluorine has seven. Seven times six is 42, plus six is 48. Now 48 is a multiple of eight. So the center element is not going to have any lone pairs. The Lewis structure of sulfur hexafluoride looks like this. It has an octahedral molecular geometry, which is the same as the electron pair geometry, and it's nonpolar. Fluorine is more electronegative than sulfur, so if you draw the dipole moments, they will all cancel. These two cancel each other, and these two will cancel each other and the remaining two will cancel as well. So due to the symmetry of this molecule, it's going to be nonpolar. Now the sulfur-fluorine bond is very polar. The EN difference is huge. Fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4.0, so the electronegativity difference is 1.5. So the bonds are very polar, but the molecule as a whole is nonpolar. So whenever sulfur bonds to um, an element that has a higher electronegativity than itself, it can form up to six bonds because sulfur has six valence electrons to give. When sulfur is attached to an element that is less electronegative than itself, like hydrogen, sulfur will only need to acquire two electrons to get to eight. So it likes to form two bonds in that case. So that's why in H2S it just it only has two bonds but in SF6 it can have up to six. Now it doesn't always have to have six if it's bonded to an element that is more electronegative than itself. For example in SF2 or SF4 sulfur can give away up to six electrons but it doesn't have to give all. It can give two, it can give four but it usually gives up to six electrons. So generally speaking, sulfur will form anywhere between two and four bonds, depending on what it's attached to. But now let's talk about the bond angles for this molecule. What is the bond angle for the octahedral shape? Now, the bond angle between these two fluorine atoms is 180. Let's redraw the structure. So we have a, a sulfur atom at the center. And between these two fluorine atoms, the bond angle is 180. Now, if you focus on the fluorine atoms at the center, the bond angles will be equal to 90 degrees. So the bond angles between these two are about 90. Imagine if you have a square. 
the angles in a square are 90 degrees. Or imagine if you have a circle and if you split the circle in four ways. Let's say this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. These two are perpendicular. The angle here is about 90. Now the angle between these two fluorine atoms is also 90 degrees. Imagine if the four fluorine atoms at the center is in the, the xy plane. The two fluorine atoms, the one on top and on the bottom, is on the z-axis. So between the z-axis and the xy plane, you have a 90 degree angle. Now try this one, PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for this molecule. Determine the hybridization, the molecular geometry, and the bond angles, and if it's polar or nonpolar. So phosphorus has five valence electrons. Chlorine has seven times five, which is 35, plus five is 40. Since 40 is a multiple of eight, there's going to be no lone pairs on the central phosphorus atom. So we have five chlorine atoms. Since each chlorine atom has one bond, it's going to have three lone pairs. So if you add up all the electrons, the total is 40. As we can see, phosphorus has an expanded octet. It has five bonds, which is 10 electrons. So as you mentioned before, because phosphorus has five valence electrons, it can try to acquire three electrons or give away all five electrons. In this case, it's given away its five electrons to the chlorine atoms. So that's why it's forming five bonds, as we see here. Now, what is the hybridization? of the central phosphorus atom. Phosphorus is attached to five chlorine atoms, so it has five groups. It's going to be S1, P3, D1 hybridized. 1 plus 3 plus 1 adds up to 5. Now what about the bond angles? Now what is the molecular geometry? Whenever you have an atom attached to five other atoms, the molecular geometry, which is going to be the same as the electron pair geometry, is trigonal by pyramidal. When I hear the word trigonal, I think of a triangle. The three chlorine atoms in the center, they form a triangle. By pyramidal, I think of two pyramids. One at the top, there's the top pyramid, and one at the bottom. Here is the, the bottom pyramid. So trigonal bipyramidal. That can help you to remember the name of this shape. Now what about the polarity? Is it polar or nonpolar? Whenever the center element, if it doesn't have any lone pairs, and if all of the outer elements are identical, typically it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. So PCL5 is nonpolar. The bonds are polar, but the molecule is nonpolar. Phosphorus has an electronegativity of 2.1, and for Cl, it's 3.0. So the En difference is bigger than 0.5, so the bonds are polar. Now, if you draw the dipole moments, they're going to point towards the more electronegative chlorine atom. So these two, they cancel because they're antiparallel. They're exactly opposite of each other. Now the other three cancel as well. So we have one arrow that goes towards the left. There's one that travels in the, the northeast direction and one in the southeast direction. So let's draw the vectors. We have a vector towards the left, 
another vector, and another vector. So the vector that's in the northeast direction, it has an x component and a y component. The vector in the southeast direction also has an x component and a y component. Notice that the two y components, they're anti-parallel, they cancel. However, the two x components is just enough to cancel with the vector that's in the the negative x direction. So these two cancel with the one in the left. So overall, this is a nonpolar molecule. All of the vectors, all of the dipole moments will cancel out so that the, the sum of the dipole moments is zero, which is typical of a nonpolar molecule. So anytime you have symmetry, anytime all of the outer elements are the same, just know it's going to be nonpolar. Now, one thing I forgot to do is go over the hybridization of sulfur hexafluoride. So what do you think the hybridization is for this particular molecule? It has an octahedral molecular geometry, and it has six fluorine atoms. So the hybridization is going to be S1, P3, D2. 1 plus 3 plus 2 adds up to 6. So I just want to make sure I went over that before I forget. Now, when drawing difficult, complicated molecules, it helps to use the multiple of 8 rule to determine the number of lone pairs on the molecule or on a center atom. If you do this, it's going to make it a lot easier to draw the Lewis structure. So let's do a few examples of that so you can get used to the technique. And remember, this technique doesn't work if there's a hydrogen atom attached to the molecule. Try this one. SF4, sulfur tetrafluoride. So first, let's add up the number of valence electrons. Sulfur has six. Fluorine has seven, but there's four of them. Seven times four is 28 plus six. That's going to be 34. So 34 is not a multiple of eight, which tells us that there's going to be at least one lone pair on a central sulfur atom. To find how many lone pairs, subtract 34 by the highest multiple of 8. Multiples of 8 are 8, 16, 24, 32, 40 is too much. So let's subtract it by 32. So this gives us 2 electrons, which equates to 1 lone pair. So let's put 2 electrons on a central sulfur atom. And we know fluorine likes to form one bond. So this is the Lewis structure of SF4. Now, whenever fluorine has one bond, it's going to have three lone pairs. So every fluorine atom has eight electrons. Eight, 16, 24, 32, 34. So we have the correct number of electrons. Now, what is the molecular geometry for this molecule? It turns out whenever the central atom has or is attached to four other atoms, and if it contains one lone pair, the molecular geometry is called seesaw. The electron pair geometry, it has five groups, which is four atoms, one lone pair. The electron pair geometry is going to be trigonal by pyramidal. But the molecular shape is seesaw. Now, is this molecule polar or is it nonpolar? What would you say? Whenever an element, if the central element only has one lone pair, not two, but if it has one, it's safe to say that it's going to be polar. So let's analyze the dipole moments. These two cancel. However, we don't have anything to cancel the dipole moments for the two arrows in purple. So the SF4 molecule is a polar molecule. It has a net dipole moment. These two are pointed in the same general direction. The Y components of those two vectors, they, they're additive. But the X components are cancel because one is slightly to the left, the other is slightly to the right. 
Oh, by the way, what is the hybridization on the central sulfur atom? So if you add up the number of groups it has, it has uh, four atoms, one lone pair, so it has five groups. The hybridization is going to be S1P3D1. Try this one. SF2. Go ahead and draw the molecular geometry for this substance. So to draw the Lewis structure, sulfur has six valence electrons, fluorine has seven times two. So that's 14 plus six, which is 20. 20 is not a multiple of eight, but the highest multiple of eight just under 20 is 16. So this gives us a difference of four, which is two lone pairs or four dots. Now fluorine likes to form one bond, and it's gonna have three lone pairs each. So this is the Lewis structure of the SF2 molecule. And like H2O, it has a bent molecular geometry, but a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. And this molecule, it's going to be polar, which is typical of any bent molecule. The dipole moments will point towards the sulfur atom. So if we draw the vectors, the Y components, of these two dipole moments, they're additive, they're pointing in the same direction, but the X components cancel. So therefore, we have a net dipole moment that's in a negative Y direction based on the way it's drawn. So SF2 is a polar molecule and has a bent shape. The hybridization at the central sulfur atom is going to be SP3 hybridized. It has four groups, one, two, three, four. Try this one, xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon has eight valence electrons. It's in group 8A, which is the last column of the periodic table. That's the noble gases. And seven times four. Seven for fluorine atoms, and it's four of them. Seven times four is 28, plus eight is 36. If we subtract it by 34, um, 32, excuse me, which is the highest multiple of 8, just under 36, you get 4. So xenon has 4 dots, or 2 lone pairs. And it's attached to 4 fluorine atoms. So it looks like this. Each of which will contain 3 lone pairs. So what is the molecular geometry of this molecule? What would you say? And what is the electron pair geometry? Now we have four atoms attached to the center atom and two lone pairs. Whenever you have that situation, the molecular shape is going to be square planar. The bond angles between the fluorine atoms are 90 degrees. The electron pair geometry is going to be octahedral since you have a total of six groups. You can treat the lone pairs as if they were atoms. So if you have an element with six atoms, it's going to have an octahedral shape. So that's the electron pair geometry. Now, this particular molecule, is it polar or is it nonpolar? Molecules that have only one lone pair on a center atom are usually polar molecules. For example, NH3, which has a trigonal pyramidal shape, is a polar molecule. Another example is SO2. It has only one lone pair. It has a bent molecular geometry. That's a polar molecule. And also, Sulfur tetrafluoride, which has a seesaw shape, it too has only one lone pair on a center atom. That's a polar molecule. Now you need to be careful with elements that have two lone pairs because they may or may not be polar. The key to focus on is symmetry. If the electrons are distributed evenly, it's usually nonpolar. If they're distributed unevenly, then it tends to be polar. So in the case of water, 
water usually looks like this. It has a bent shape. But notice that the lone pairs, I mean, this molecule may seem symmetrical if you draw a line of symmetry here, but notice that the, the lone pairs are not exactly opposite to each other. They're on the same side. As a result, this is going to be a polar molecule. But here, notice that the lone pairs are on opposite sides of the molecule. In that sense, you can see that there's symmetry right here. So therefore, XCF4 is a nonpolar molecule. And also, these two, they cancel. And these two dipole moments as well cancels. So if you see the shape, this square planar molecular geometry, it's going to be a nonpolar. I guess if you think about the symmetry, in the case of water, it appears to be symmetrical here, but not here. But in XCF4, it's symmetrical on the y-axis and on the x-axis. It's completely symmetrical. So I guess you can use a symmetry test in both ways. But either case, this is a nonpolar molecule. Oh, by the way, the hybridization at the central xenon atom is S1P3D2 hybridized. It has six groups, one, two, three, four, and the two lone pairs. Try this one, iodine pentafluoride. So iodine has seven valence electrons. The same is true for fluorine. 7 times 5 is 35, plus 7 is 42. So to find the highest multiple of 8, it's going to be 8, 16, 24, 32, 40. So we're going to have two dots, or one lone pair, on the central iodine atom. Each fluorine atom is going to have a single bond. and they all have three lone pairs. So this is the Lewis structure for IF5. Now, would you say it's polar or nonpolar? So notice that the center element only has one lone pair. This molecule is going to be polar. So the dipole moments in red will cancel they're opposite to each other and the dipole moments in purple will cancel as well however there's nothing to cancel the dipole moment between the iodine and the fluorine atom in yellow so this molecule has a net dipole moment which means that it's going to be polar the molecular geometry for this molecule is called square pyramidal Now, let's talk about why that's the case. So let's uh, redraw it. Now, the base of the molecule has a shape of a square. And we have a fluorine atom on top. and the lone pair in the bottom. But looking at the atoms only, you could see that it has a base of a square and it forms a, a pyramid. So it's a square pyramidal structure. And if you can see that, it's going to help you to remember the name of the molecular shape. So it's square pyramidal. So therefore, the bond angle between the fluorine atoms and the plane of the square is about 90 degrees. And also, between these two, since they're perpendicular to each other, this is about 90 as well. The hybridization at the central iodine atom is going to be S1P3D2 hybridized. 
since it has a total of six groups, five fluorine atoms and one lone pair. And the electron pair geometry is octahedral, even though the molecular geometry is square pyramidal. The total number of groups is six. So whenever the number of atoms and lone pairs add up to six, the electron pair geometry will be octahedral. If they add up to five, the EPG, electron pair geometry, is going to be trigonal bipyramidal. If they add up to four, it's going to be tetrahedral, three, trigonal planar, and two, linear. Now, what about the triiodide ion, I3 minus? So let's draw the Lewis structure for it. So iodine has seven valence electrons times three plus one for the negative charge. 7 times 3 is 21, plus 1 is 22. So let's subtract it by 16. So this will give us 6 dots, or 3 lone pairs, on the central iodine atom. Typically, iodine, like any other halogen, chlorine, bromine, or fluorine, usually likes to form one bond. And this is going to be the case when it's not the center element. For the examples that you've seen before, whenever chlorine or fluorine is not the center element, it usually only has one bond. However, when it's the center element, it can have an expanded octet. So it can have more than one bond. Just keep that in mind. But when it's not the center element, the halogens will usually have one bond. This is the Lewis structure for the triiodide ion. The overall charge is minus 1. Now let's calculate the formal charge of iodine. So for this one it should be 0 because it has its desired number of bonds. The equation is it's the number of valence electrons which is 7 minus the number of bonds which is 1 plus the 6 dots. So 7 minus 7 is 0. Now let's calculate the formal charge of the iodine in the middle. It's going to be 7 minus the 2 bonds and 6 dots, so 7 minus 8, negative 1. So that's why the overall charge is negative, because the one in the middle has a negative formal charge. The molecular geometry is linear. As you can see, it's a straight line. So therefore, the bond angle is 180. Now, the electron pair geometry is not linear, because the total number of groups is 5. It has 2 atoms and three lone pairs. So the electron pair geometry is trigonal bipyramidal. The hybridization for five groups is S1P3D1. Now I want to show you something else that can also help you to identify the correct Lewis structure when there's multiple acceptable Lewis structures, or at least how to find the most stable Lewis structure. Sometimes you'll have resonance forms where there's more than one way to draw a Lewis structure. And some Lewis structures are more stable than others. Generally speaking, the most stable Lewis structure is the one where the formal charge of the center element is zero. Now we said that the formal charge is equal to the valence electrons minus the bonds and the dots. We know how to calculate the number of dots using the multiple of eight technique. So for structures that have multiple acceptable Lewis structures, we want the formal charge to be zero. So let's solve for the number of bonds. So if we add B to both sides, it turns out that the number of bonds to minimize the formal charge or to get a formal charge of zero, it's going to be the valence electrons minus the number of dots. Now keep this equation in mind. We're going to use it later. If we add D to both sides, notice that the number of bonds and dots adds up to the valence electrons. Let's focus on this expression. This is true if the net charge is zero, if there's a formal charge of zero. Keep that in mind, by the way. So let's use sulfur as an example. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Notice that in most structures that we've come across so far, 
the number of bonds and dots adds up to the number of valence electrons. For example, in H2S, notice that sulfur has four dots and two bonds, which adds up to the number of valence electrons. In SO2, particularly this structure, it has four bonds, two dots, which adds up to six. In SF2, we had a structure that looks like this. So it has two bonds, four dots, which adds up to six. In SF4, we had one lone pair, four bonds. So four bonds plus two dots adds up to six. And finally, in SF6, we had six bonds, zero dots, which still adds up to six. So generally speaking, if, the, if you want to draw the most stable structure in which the formal charge is zero, the number of bonds and dots adds up to the number of valence electrons. Now let's move on to structures that have resonance. Resonance occurs when you can draw a Lewis structure in multiple ways. You can move around the electrons without moving the atoms. So consider the carbonate structure, CO3, 2 minus. Let's draw the Lewis structure for this. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has six times three plus the minus two charge. Six times three is 18 plus two is 20 plus four is 24. So 24 is a multiple of eight. And that tells us that there's gonna be no lone pairs on a central carbon atom. Now we know that carbon likes to form four bonds. So we have to draw it like this. Whenever oxygen has two bonds, it's going to have two lone pairs. When it has one bond, it's going to have three lone pairs. And this is the Lewis structure of the carbonate molecule. So what is the formal charge on this oxygen? If you calculate the formal charge, it's going to be the six valence electrons minus the two bonds and the four dots. Six minus six is zero, so it's neutral which is typical whenever oxygen has two bonds. But when it has one bond, as in the case of hydroxide, it's going to have a negative charge. If you calculate the formal charge for this one, it's going to be 6 minus the one bond and six dots. 6 minus 7 is negative 1. So each of these have a minus 1 formal charge. Thus, we could see why the total charge is negative 2. So this is the Lewis structure for the carbonate molecule. Now, if you want to, you can enclose it in brackets. Now, how can we draw the resonance structure of this molecule? If you want to draw the resonance structure, you can simply move the double bond from one oxygen atom to another. But you can show how it's going to move. And we can use arrows to represent the flow of electrons. A full-headed arrow represents the flow of two electrons. A half arrow represents the flow of one electron. So we can take two electrons, which equates to a lone pair, and use it to form a double bond, and take the two electrons in this double bond and push it back on the oxygen on top. So then we're going to get a structure that looks like this. So the double bond is now here. So we had three lone pairs on the oxygen in the lower right. Now we only have two lone pairs here. Now the oxygen in the lower left, it remained the same. Now the oxygen on top, it gained two electrons. So it has three lone pairs. So these two initially had the negative charge. Now, these two bear the negative charge. So as you can see, the electrons can move around, creating another Lewis structure. And so 
this is an example of resonance. Try this one, the nitrite ion. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure and also one resonance form. So nitrogen has five valence electrons, oxygen has six times two plus one, so that's 12 plus five, that's 17 plus one, which is 18. And let's subtract it by 16. So this tells us that the center or the central nitrogen atom has one lone pair or two dots. Now, if we wish to calculate the number of bonds on the central nitrogen atom such that the formal charge will be zero, it's going to be the valence electrons minus the dots. Nitrogen has five valence electrons minus two dots, so it's going to want three bonds, which is typical of a nitrogen atom. So this is going to be one, two, three. So one of these have to have a double bond. So this is the Lewis structure of the nitrite ion. Whenever oxygen has one bond, it usually has a negative charge. So thus we can see why the overall charge is minus one. To draw the resonance form, we can take a lone pair, use it to form a double bond, and break this double bond and push those two electrons on the other oxygen atom. So now, we have a Lewis structure that looks like this. So as you can see, these two structures are equivalent. They're the same. And so that's how you can draw the resonance structure for the nitrite ion. Now there's something called resonance hybrid. The actual molecule is actually an average of the two. The double bond is shared equally between these two oxygen atoms. So if you want to draw the resonance hybrid, here's what you need to do. So each oxygen atom will always have at least one bond. Now because the double bond can be shared between both oxygen atoms, you can draw it using uh, dashes. So this is the, the resonance hybrid of NO2. Now I'm missing two more electrons because this one has two lone pairs, this one has three. So to distribute those two extra electrons equally, let's put one on this oxygen atom and one on that one. So it should look something like that. Now what about the BF3 molecule? Draw the Lewis structure for this molecule and also any resonance structures that you can think of. Boron has three, fluorine has seven times three, the total is 24, which is a multiple of eight, so there's no lone pairs on the central boron atom. Now boron likes to form three bonds, and fluorine likes to form one. So the Lewis structure should look like this. It has a trigonal planar shape, a bond angle of 120, and boron is currently sp2 hybridized, or at least it appears to be sp2 hybridized. Now, can we draw any resonance structures for this molecule? Right now, boron has an incomplete octet. It has three bonds, but it can form four. So the fluorine atom can use one of its lone pairs to form a double bond, in which case, we're going to get a resonance structure that looks like this. Now, which resonance structure is more stable? The one on the left or the one on the right? So far, the other, three, the other two examples that we looked at, the resonance structures were equal. But now, these two structures are not equal. So one structure is more stable than the other. Which one is it? So let's calculate the formal charge of boron. Boron has three valence electrons minus three bonds, zero dots. So it has a formal charge of zero, which is good. 
Now let's focus on fluorine. Let's find the formal charge of this fluorine atom, which is the same as the other two. So fluorine has seven valence electrons. In this structure, it has one bond, six dots. Seven minus seven is zero. So the structure on the left is very stable because the formal charge of every element is zero. Now let's focus on the structure on the right side. Let's start with boron. So boron has three valence electrons. It has four bonds, zero dots. So in this case, it has a negative one formal charge. Three minus four is negative one. Now what about this fluorine atom? Because it has two bonds, the formal charge is not going to be zero. So fluorine has seven valence electrons, and in that structure it has two bonds, four dots, seven minus six is one. So it has a plus one charge. So the total charge is still zero, but due to the separation of charge, this resonance form is less stable. It's still an acceptable Lewis structure because the octet of boron is satisfied. Boron has four bonds or eight electrons. However, the formal charge is negative one, which is less stable than the formal charge of zero. Here it's neutral. So due to the fact that this structure is completely neutral, it doesn't have any formal charge, we should expect that this form is more stable. However, this form is still an acceptable Lewis structure. It's simply not the most stable Lewis structure. Now let's get back to our discussion on SO2. We said that it has multiple Lewis structures that you can represent it with. Now we know that the total number of electrons is 18. And if we subtract it by 16, we can see that it's going to have one lone pair or two dots. Now some of you out there might be inclined to draw it uh, this way. You might put two bonds on one oxygen and a single bond on the other, such that sulfur can have eight electrons to satisfy its octet requirement. So this is two, four, six, eight. So in this case, sulfur has a complete octet, which is good. This structure is acceptable but is it the most stable structure? So we can draw the resonance form of this structure. We can take a lone pair from oxygen and use it to form a double bond. In which case, we'll get the other structure. So both Lewis structures are acceptable, but they're not equally stable. So remember, if you want to draw the Lewis structure, the most stable one, where the formal charge of the center atom is zero, the number of valence electrons must equal the bonds plus the dots. So if we look at the sulfur atom on the right, it has four bonds, two dots, which adds up to the six valence electrons of the sulfur atom. Now for the structure on the left, it has three bonds and two dots. So therefore, that tells us that this sulfur atom has a formal charge, so it's not the most stable structure. Therefore, this one is the most stable structure. If you calculate the formal charge on each, starting with the one on the left, it's going to be the six valence electrons of sulfur minus the three bonds and two dots. So six minus five is plus one. Therefore, the sulfur atom has a positive charge. And the oxygen atom, which has a single bond, has a negative charge. For the structure on the right, sulfur has six valence electrons, four bonds, two dots, six minus six is zero, so it's neutral. Therefore, this is the most stable form of vessel two. Try this one. Draw the Lewis structure of the nitrite ion, and also draw one resonance form for it. The nitrogen has five valence electrons, Oxygen has 6 times 3 plus the negative 1 charge. 6 times 3 is 18 plus 5, that's 23, plus 1 is 24. Now 24 is a multiple of 8, so there's no lone pairs on the central nitrogen atom. Now nitrogen usually likes to form 3 bonds, 
but in order for us to satisfy its octet requirement, we need to put four bonds, which means that it's going to have a formal charge. It's not going to be neutral. So one, two, three, four. Oxygen is going to have two lone pairs when it has a double bond and three lone pairs when it has a single bond. Now we know that the nitrogen atom or the oxygen atom that has one bond is going to have a negative one formal charge. To calculate the formal charge on the nitrogen atom, it's going to be five valence electrons minus the four bonds and zero dots. So it has a positive formal charge. Negative one plus one plus another negative one adds up to a net charge of negative one. This is the Lewis structure of the nitrate ion. Because it has a formal charge, it doesn't have its desired number of bonds, which is three bonds. Another example is NH4+. In this molecule, nitrogen has four bonds. So therefore, it has a positive formal charge. For the nitrate ion, NO3-, the molecular geometry is trigonal planar so the bond angle is 120. For NH4+, it's a tetrahedral shape, so we should expect the bond angle to be 109.5 for that. Now, let's draw the resonance structure. So let's take a lone pair from this oxygen. Let's use it to form a double bond, and let's break this double bond and push a lone pair on that oxygen. So this is going to be a single, and this is going to be a double. And now there's going to be two lone pairs on this oxygen atom, but three on this one. So that's how you can draw the resonance structure for the nitrate ion. So basically, this double bond can move anywhere among those three oxygen atoms. So now let's try another problem. How can we draw the Lewis structure for SOF2? Now let's put everything that we've learned together to draw like these harder Lewis structures, particularly when there's multiple elements. So keep this in mind. Remember that oxygen likes to form two bonds and fluorine likes to form one bond whenever they're not the center element. And when you have a molecule with three different elements, how do you know which one is going to be the center atom? It may not always be the middle one. Right now, oxygen is in the middle, but doesn't mean that it's going to be the center element. Fluorine likes to form one bond. Oxygen likes to form two, but sulfur can form anywhere between two to six. In the presence of elements that are more electronegative than sulfur, sulfur prefers to give away its six valence electrons than to acquire two. The only way it's going to acquire two electrons is if it's attached to an element that's less electronegative than itself. But because oxygen and fluorine really want electrons, they're going to pull it away from sulfur. So in this case, sulfur, because it can form the most number of bonds, is going to be the atom in the center. So let's add up the number of electrons in this molecule. Sulfur has six, oxygen has six as well, and fluorine has seven, but times two which is 14 plus 6 is 20 plus another 6 is 26. So let's calculate the number of dots on the center sulfur atom. So let's subtract 26 by the highest multiple of 8, just under 26. That's 24, which is 2. Now let's calculate the number of bonds that sulfur wants to have in order to minimize the formal charge. So the number of bonds is going to be the valence electrons minus the number of dots. Sulfur has six valence electrons and it has two dots, so it wants four bonds. So let's draw the sulfur atom and let's put the two lone pairs. And let's put the two fluorine atoms and the oxygen atom in the middle. Now we need four bonds. Fluorine wants to have one bond, and oxygen wants to have two. So this works out. The number of bonds and dots at the central sulfur atom is six. We have four bonds, two dots, which add up to six. Whenever fluorine has one bond, it's going to want three 
lone pairs. And oxygen has two bonds, so it wants two lone pairs. So that's the best way to draw the Lewis structure for SOF2. Now let's try another example like this. Try this one, POCl3. Actually, just POCl. So feel free to pause the video as you work on this example. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, sulfur has six, chlorine has seven, so the total is 18, which means that phosphorus has one lone pair, or two dots. To calculate the number of bonds, it's going to be the valence electrons minus the number of dots if the formal charge can be zero. So phosphorus has five valence electrons, two dots, so it wants to have three bonds. Oxygen likes to have two bonds, chlorine likes to have one, so this works out. And this is the Lewis structure of POCl. Let's try another example. SO2Cl2. Sulfur has six, oxygen has six times two, and chlorine has seven. So this is 6 plus 12 plus 14. 6 plus 14 is 20, plus 12, that's 32. So 32 is a multiple of 8, so there's no dots. Now the number of bonds, it's going to be the number of valence electrons minus the number of dots. Sulfur has 6 valence electrons and no dots, so it wants to have 6 bonds. So we have two oxygen atoms and two chlorine atoms. Chlorine likes to form one bond. Oxygen likes to form two bonds. So now we have six bonds. Whenever an outer element has only one bond, it's going to have three lone pairs. When it has two bonds, two lone pairs. So that's how you can draw the Lewis structure of SO2Cl2. As you can see, it has a tetrahedral molecular geometry and the hybridization at the central sulfur atom is going to be sp3 hybridized. Try this one. XeOF2. Xenon has 8, oxygen has 6 valence electrons, fluorine has 7. 7 times 2 is 14, plus 6 is 20, plus 8 is 28. So if we take away 24 from it, we're going to get 4. So that tells us that xenon has two lone pairs or four dots. So to calculate the number of bonds that will produce a formal charge of zero, it's going to be the eight valence electrons of xenon minus the four dots. So xenon wants to have four bonds left over. So let's put the two fluorine atoms on the side and the oxygen atom in the middle just to make it symmetrical or to have some sort of symmetry. So fluorine likes to form one bond, oxygen likes to form two, and then just add the appropriate number of lone pairs. So this is the Lewis structure of XeOF2. So because xenon has eight valence electrons, you want the number of bonds and dots to add up to eight. So in this structure, xenon have four bonds, four dots, which adds up to the eight valence electrons that it has. So this is the most stable and acceptable Lewis structure of this particular molecule. Now let's go over some polyatomic ions. We're going to do a few of these, particularly the ones with expanded octatics. So try this one, sulfate. So we're just going to focus on drawing the Lewis structures. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen has six, but times four. And let's add the, let's add two electrons due to the minus two charge. Six times four is 24, plus four is 30, plus two is 32. So 32 is a multiple of eight. So there's no lone pairs on the sulfur atom. So to calculate the number of bonds, to minimize the formal charge, it's going to be the valence electrons minus the number of dots. Sulfur has six valence electrons, zero dots, so it wants to have six bonds. The only way to do that 
is for two oxygens to be double bonded. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's add two lone pairs to the double bonded oxygen atoms and three lone pairs to the ones with a single bond. Anytime oxygen has one bond, it's going to have a negative one formal charge. So we can see why the total charge is minus two. That's the Lewis structure for the sulfate ion. As you can see, the number of bonds and dots adds up to the valence electrons of sulfur whenever the formal charge is zero. Try this one, phosphate. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, and then oxygen is six times four plus three. This adds up to, let's see, four times six is 24, plus five is 29, plus three is 32. So that's a multiple of eight. So there's no lone pairs on the central phosphorus atom, which means that the number of valence electrons is going to be equal to the number of bonds, since the number of dots is zero. So phosphorus wants five bonds in this particular structure. So one, two, three, four, five. This is the Lewis structure for the phosphate ion. So each of these single bonded oxygen atoms has a negative formal charge, and we can see why the total is negative three. And let's uh, enclose it in brackets. Now what about the phosphite ion? Try this one. Three times six is 18 plus five. That's 23 plus three is 26. So 26 is not a multiple of eight. If we subtract it by 24, that tells us that phosphorus is gonna have two dots or one lone pair. So the number of bonds is gonna be the valence electrons minus the number of dots. So phosphorus wants three remaining bonds. So let's start with a lone pair. And we have three oxygen atoms. So each of them has to have a single bond. So that they each have a negative one formal charge. So the total charge is still negative three. So this is the Lewis structure for the phosphite ion. Now, just to make sure that you've mastered this topic, I want you to draw the Lewis structure of the polyatomic ions that contain chlorine. So draw the Lewis structure for the perchlorate ion, the chlorate ion, the chlorite ion, and the hypochlorite ion. If you can get these right, then uh, you basically have mastered the topic. So let's start with the perchlorate ion, ClO4 minus. So chlorine has seven valence electrons, plus four times six for the four oxygen atoms, and one for the negative one charge. Four times six is 24, plus one is 25, plus seven is 32. So since that's a multiple of eight, there's no lone pairs on the central chlorine atom. Now let's calculate the number of bonds, which is going to be the valence electrons minus the number of dots. Since there's no lone pairs, it's just going to be 7 minus 0. Chlorine has 7 valence electrons. So we need 7 bonds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the oxygen, which has a single bond, is going to have 3 lone pairs and a negative 1 charge. The chlorine atom is going to be neutral. If you calculate the formal charge, it's going to be 7 valence electrons minus 7 bonds and 0 dots, which is going to be 0. So we can see why the total charge is minus 1. It's due to this oxygen atom. So that's the Lewis structure of the perchlorate ion. Now let's move on to the chlorate ion, ClO3 minus. So it's 7 for chlorine, 3 times 6 plus 1. 3 times 6 is 18 plus 7, that's uh, 25, plus 1 is 26. So if we subtract it by 24, we're going to have two dots or one lone pair on the central chlorine atom. 
Now let's calculate the number of bonds, which is going to be the valence electrons minus the dots. So chlorine has seven valence electrons, two dots, so it wants five bonds remaining. One, two, three, four, five. So the only oxygen that has the negative charge is this one. So that's the structure for the chlorate ion. Now let's move on to the chloride ion, ClO2 minus. So it's going to be 7 plus 2 times 6 plus 1. 2 times 6 is 12, plus 7, that's 19, plus 1 is 20. Subtracted by 18, that gives us 4. So we have two lone pairs, or four dots, on the center chlorine atom. Now let's calculate the number of bonds. So chlorine has seven valence electrons, four dots, so we need three bonds. So we're going to put a double bond on one oxygen and a single bond on the other. So this is the one that has the negative charge. So that's the Lewis structure for the chloride ion. And then the last one of the chlorine series is going to be the hypochlorite ion, which is 7 plus 6 plus 1. And that adds up to 14. And 14 minus 8 is 6. So we're going to have 6 or six dots or 3 lone pairs on the center chlorine atom. So if you calculate the number of bonds, it's 7 valence electrons minus 6. It's just going to be one bond. And oxygen is going to have three lone pairs as well, but it's going to bear the negative charge. So that's the Lewis structure of the, the hypochlorite ion. Now let's move on to the radicals. Let's draw the Lewis structure for NO2. A radical is basically a substance that have an odd number of electrons. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, oxygen has six times two, which is 12, plus five is 17. Whenever you get an odd number, you're going to have a radical. So basically, instead of having a lone pair, which is two dots, you're going to have half of a lone pair, which is a single dot. If you subtract this by 16, you're going to get one. So this half a lone pair, or a single dot, on the nitrogen atom. Now, we know that nitrogen cannot have more than eight electrons. But we want to get to, we want to get as close as to eight as possible. So what should we do in this case? If we calculate the number of bonds, which is valence electrons minus dots, nitrogen has five valence electrons and it has one dot. So ideally, we would probably want four, but we can't have four. So this equation is not going to work for radicals. So it's good to know that. So we're just going to have to just use our understanding of Lewis structures. Elements in a second row, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, cannot have more than eight. So if we put four bonds, this is not going to work. Nitrogen will have nine electrons. That's a violation of the octet rule. It's not like phosphorus or sulfur where it can have an expanded octet. So therefore, the most that we can get to is three bonds. If we have three bonds in one dot, nitrogen has seven valence electrons, two, four, six, seven. So we can't exceed eight, but we want to get to as close as eight as possible. And this is as far as we can go. And whenever oxygen has a double bond, we need to add two lone pairs and three when it has a single bond. So this is the Lewis structure for NO2, nitrogen dioxide. Now let's try another one, NO, nitrogen monoxide. So nitrogen has five, O has six, so this adds up to 11. Now, What can we do in this example? 
So let's start by putting N and O. We know that oxygen likes to form two bonds, and nitrogen likes to form three. So if we start out with, uh, well first, let's subtract 11 by 8. If we do that, that's going to give us 3. That tells us that one of these elements is going to have 3 electrons. Which is probably the less electronegative element. But now let's focus on the bonds. Let's get back to that 3. Should we start with 3 bonds or 2 bonds? Well, let's try 3 bonds. Let's see what's going to happen. If we add 3 bonds, oxygen can only have one lone pair, and the same is true for nitrogen. Otherwise, they will have more than 8 electrons. And right now, if you add up the electrons, you only get a total of 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So it can't be 3 bonds. So let's go down to 2 bonds. Now, if we have 2 bonds, we need to add 2 lone pairs to oxygen. So right now, we have a total of 8 electrons. And then we can add the other three to nitrogen, or we can do it this way. We can add three to oxygen and four to nitrogen. So in both cases, we have a total of 11 electrons. And one element has eight electrons, the other has seven. So which structure is better? Which element prefers to have eight? Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. The electronegativity for fluorine is 4.0, for oxygen is 3.5, and for nitrogen is 3.0. Because oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, it's going to pull the electrons toward itself. So oxygen is going to be the one that has two lone pairs, or four dots, instead of nitrogen, since it has a greater pull of electrons. So therefore, the most acceptable Lewis structure is this one. If you calculate the formal charge of each element, it's going to be zero. A quick way to tell is that, or is to check that the number of bonds and dots to see if it's equal to the number of valence electrons. In the case of oxygen, oxygen has two bonds, four dots, which equates to six and oxygen has six valence electrons. Nitrogen has two bonds, three dots, so that adds up to five, which is good. If you calculate the formal charge of the nitrogen atom, it's gonna be five valence electrons minus the two bonds and the three dots, it's gonna be zero. But for the other structure that we had earlier, that's not gonna be the case. It's going to be five valence electrons for nitrogen, two bonds, four dots. So in this structure, nitrogen has a negative one formal charge, which means oxygen is probably going to have a positive one formal charge. It's going to be six valence electrons for oxygen, two bonds, three dots. That's plus one. So this particular Lewis structure is less stable. So therefore, this is the most acceptable Lewis structure for nitrogen monoxide. So anytime you have an odd number of electrons, you're going to have a radical. So we can see where the 3 comes from. One of the elements have three dots around it. Now what about this structure, SCN minus, the thiocyanate ion? How can we draw the Lewis structure for that? So we have a polyatomic ion with three different elements. So you want to identify which element is going to be the center atom. So nitrogen likes to form three bonds. Carbon likes to form four bonds. Sulfur could form anywhere from two to six. So should we put sulfur in the middle or carbon in the middle? What would you say? Let's see what would happen if we put sulfur in the middle. So carbon wants to have four bonds. Nitrogen wants to have three. Sulfur, at most, wants to have six, so 
this is probably not going to be an ideal situation. Remember, sulfur is going to be in between two to six bonds. Sometimes it could be one. But it's rare that sulfur is going to have more than six bonds. It's unlikely. So let's try putting carbon in the middle. So one possible structure that we can draw is putting a triple bond between carbon and nitrogen and a single bond with sulfur. So if sulfur has one bond, it's probably going to have a formal charge, but it's better than having seven bonds. Or we can do this. We can give sulfur two bonds, which it's going to be okay with that, and nitrogen two bonds. So either case, one of these elements is not going to be happy. And we do have a negative charge, so we should expect that. It turns out both of these structures are acceptable. Whenever nitrogen has three bonds, it's going to have one lone pair. When it has two bonds, it has two lone pairs. When sulfur has one bond, it's going to have three lone pairs, and this one's going to have two. If we calculate the formal charge on nitrogen, it's going to be five minus the three bonds plus two dots. So as we can see, whenever nitrogen has three bonds, it has a formal charge of zero. But when it has two bonds, it's going to be 5 minus the two bonds, four dots. 5 minus 6 is negative 1. Now, when sulfur has two bonds, it has a formal charge of 0. But when it has one bond, it's going to be 6 minus the one bond and six dots. That's 6 minus 7, which is negative 1. So these two structures are resonance forms of each other. I can take a lone pair form a double bond, which will give me this bond here, and break a triple bond and put a lone pair on this nitrogen, giving me this structure. So both Lewis structures are acceptable. Every atom has eight electrons around it, so their octet requirement is satisfied. Now the question is, is it better to put a negative charge on nitrogen or on a sulfur atom? So which is more important, electronegativity or size? On the periodic table, we have elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and sulfur. If we were comparing nitrogen and oxygen, the size between these two elements is roughly about the same. Oxygen is a little bit smaller than nitrogen, but the atomic size doesn't vary that much for elements in the same row. So between nitrogen and oxygen, it's better to put the negative charge on oxygen because it's more electronegative. It can stabilize the negative charge better than the nitrogen atom. Now, between nitrogen and sulfur, sulfur is significantly bigger than nitrogen. Let's say if this is the size of nitrogen, this would be the size of sulfur. Because sulfur is so much more bigger, it can stabilize the negative charge better. The negative charge is distributed over a larger surface area, so it's less concentrated. If you compare SH- and OH-, hydroxide is a stronger base than the SH- ion. The reason being is water is less acidic than H2S. H2S is more acidic than water. So therefore, hydroxide is a stronger base. The stronger the acid, the weaker the base. The fact that hydroxide is a stronger base than SH- means that the negative charge or the oxygen atom that has the negative charge is less stable since the base is stronger. Here, the base is weaker which means that it's more stable. Whenever a molecule is stable, it's less reactive. Whenever it's more reactive, it's less stable. So as you can see, the bigger atom can stabilize the negative charge better than a smaller atom. So this is going to be the best or most stable resonance form of the thiocyanate ion. But both forms are acceptable 
It's just that this one is better. It's more stable, less reactive. Now let's go over organic molecules, particularly those with mostly carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms. For these molecules, you really don't need to add up the number of electrons. All you need to do is simply put it together. For example, let's draw the Lewis structure of ethane, C2H6. For these compounds, just remember that carbon likes to form four bonds, hydrogen can only form one, oxygen likes to form two, and nitrogen likes to form three bonds. With that information, it's enough to put this together. So because carbon can form the most number of bonds, we're going to put that in the middle. Now what you want to do when drawing these types of molecules, draw them evenly, that is with symmetry. So if there's six hydrogen atoms, let's put three on each carbon atom. So in this structure, every hydrogen atom has one bond, every carbon atom has four bonds, and that's how you draw ethane, C2H6. So now let's draw ethene, C2H4. So let's begin by putting the two carbon atoms in the center. And since there's four hydrogen atoms, let's spread them out equally. So let's put two hydrogen atoms on each carbon atom. So in order for carbon to have four bonds, we need to put a double bond. And so that's the Lewis structure for ethene. Now let's try acetylene, or ethyne, C2H2. So each carbon atom is going to have one hydrogen atom. And in order for each carbon atom to have four bonds, we need to put a triple bond. And that's the Lewis structure for acetylene. So as you can see, for the organic molecules, you just got to connect them with the appropriate number of bonds. For the organic molecules that we've just considered, the first one where the carbon atoms only had single bonds, that's called an alkane. And the one where we had a double bond between the two carbon atoms, it's an alkene. And for the triple bond, it's an alkyne. Now the next molecule is going to be an alcohol, CH3OH. This is called methanol. So the first carbon atom has three hydrogens, CH3. and it's attached to an oxygen atom that's attached to a hydrogen. So in this structure, carbon has four bonds and oxygen has two. And we know that whenever oxygen has two bonds, we need to add two lone pairs. So that's the Lewis structure for methanol. So all you gotta do is just put it together. Let's try this one, CH3, CHO. If you see OH, it's typically an alcohol, but if you see CHO, this is known as an aldehyde. So how can we draw the Lewis structure? We know that CH3 is going to look like this. It's a carbon with three hydrogens, and that's attached to another carbon. Now we can't write it like this because hydrogen can't have two bonds. And we can't draw it this way because this carbon atom will have two bonds and not four. So the only way we can make this work is if we connect a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen since oxygen wants to have two bonds and with a hydrogen to the side. This is the only way this structure can work. So carbon has four, oxygen has two, and every hydrogen atom has one bond. So that's how you can draw an aldehyde. The next molecule that we're going to go over is the ketone. So go ahead and pause the video and draw the Lewis structure. So typically, all of the carbon atoms are usually connected together. The carbon atom on the left is a CH3, which means that it has three hydrogens attached to it. And the carbon atom on the right is also a CH3. So we have an oxygen in the middle, and we know that oxygen likes to form two bonds. So this is the best way to connect them together so that every carbon atom has four bonds. And let's add the two lone pairs. So that's the Lewis structure for this particular molecule. It's a ketone, also known as 2-propanone, or simply propanone. The common name for this molecule is acetone, which is found in nail polish. Now let's try another example. So this is known as an ether, particularly dimethyl ether. A CH3 group is known as a methyl group. So let's start with the oxygen. 
the oxygen is attached to two carbons, which contain three hydrogens each. Oxygen likes to form two bonds, which it already has it, and it has two lone pairs. And that's it for the ether structure. That's all there is to it. And now let's draw the carboxylic acid. So the first carbon is going to have three hydrogens. And what about the second carbon? How can we add the two oxygens and the hydrogen? So we can't draw it like this because carbon is not going to have four bonds. That means that we need to put an oxygen on top. We don't want to put it this way because the oxygen atoms won't have two bonds. The best way to connect the structure is to put a double bond and to put the hydrogen on one of the oxygen atoms. In this case, every oxygen atom is going to have two bonds. Every carbon atom has four. So this is the Lewis structure for the carboxylic acid. This is also known as acetic acid or ethanoic acid. This is found in vinegar. What about this one? This is known as an ester. So we have three carbon atoms, but this time you got to be careful. The first carbon atom has three hydrogens. The second one is going to have two oxygen atoms, but not all of the carbon atoms are connected to each other. There's an oxygen in the middle. So this is the Lewis structure of this particular ester. Now what about this one? This is known as an amine. Particularly, this is called ethyl amine. Methyl is just a CH3, it's one carbon. Ethyl contains two carbons. So the first carbon atom has three hydrogen atoms. The second one has two hydrogen atoms and it's attached to a nitrogen atom, which has two hydrogen atoms and a lone pair. So that's the Lewis structure for ethoamine. Now this is known as an amide, particularly ethanamide, since it has two carbons. To draw the Lewis structure, the first carbon is going to have three hydrogens. It's a methyl group. The second one is going to have a carbonyl group, which is a C double bond O, and it's going to have an NH2 group. So whenever nitrogen has three bonds, it's going to have one lone pair, and oxygen usually has two. So that's how you can draw the Lewis structure for an amide. The last one is a nitrile. Whenever you see CN, typically there's a triple bond between them. So in order for this carbon atom to have four bonds, you need to put a triple bond. And so this is the Lewis structure for a nitrile. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well on your exam on Lewis structures.